Hello, everyone. Many of you have already seen my Romania presentation about the Flat Earth journey. I will cover much of that presentation here today, but with some new videos and topics as well for your consideration. As pointed out by Owen Benjamin, I'm a bit dry and technical, and I will repeat myself often, but I hope that you can nevertheless enjoy this discussion. I can't promise that it'll be entertaining, but I can at least say that it will be sincere. I only have 45 minutes, and so I will speak fast. Flat Earth is the catalyst to break the chains that mentally, spiritually, physically, and scientifically bind humanity. We Flat Earthers aren't anti-science. We Flat Earthers are unashamed truth addicts trying to free science from lies, faith-based, globe-religious zealotry, and the heliocentric nonsense that has bound it for generations. Scholastically speaking, I'm a fairly educated person. I graduated from college, magna cum laude, and I took astronomy in college. I have a master's and a juris doctorate. Up until just a few years ago, I genuinely believed in the globe and considered space and astronomy essential for the well-educated man. I would say that I underwent a paradigm shift around 2008 when I came across architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. The symmetrical and freefall collapse of World Trade Center Building 7, which was not hit by an airplane, is 100% proof that our government lied to us and that none of our institutions are there to expose or protect us from this vile conspiracy that stretches across and controls many nations. Steel constructed skyscrapers cannot collapse from small office fires symmetrically and at freefall speeds. It's impossible. 9-11 proves that our government and its owners control the narrative, the media, the military, the police forces, and all other major institutions. Yes, the 9-11 conspiracy is indeed a frightening truth. Moreover, any supposed social contract we once had with our government ended on 9-11. The United States government was in the very least an accessory in this heinous crime, which was not only used as a pretext to murder millions, but also to deprive all Americans and future generations of liberty under the threat of a manufactured boogeyman. Despite my vehement distrust of the U.S. government, I somehow still considered NASA exempt from the corruption. That all changed when I read David McGowan's Wagging the Moon Doggy, which thoroughly debunked the Apollo moon missions. I loved space too. I really wanted to believe in NASA, but the evidence that NASA lied is indisputable. NASA is a criminal organization that steals $59 million per day under false pretense. Seriously, how can any intelligent person think that this is genuine footage of a spaceship in lunar orbit? NASA is a scam. In addition, any reverence I had for academia ended with wagging the moondoggy, as no major institution has ever pointed out the blatant lie. The lunar lander is a piece of junk made from curtain rods, aluminum foil, tar paper, scotch tape, some useless space-looking abstract art sculptures, and some very poor construction. Does that really look like a spaceship to you? Look at the astronauts suspended by wires. The wires are visible throughout the Apollo missions. Look at the telltale signs of 1960s movie backdrops used throughout all of the Apollo missions. Research how the inverse square law of light and how that proves the moon landings were fake. Then around April 2015, I had a larger paradigm shift. A friend of mine and a fellow NASA moon landings debunker, who many of you know as Jibby Jedi, sent me an email to check out a video by Mark Sargent. I was highly skeptical, but I soon realized that there was enough substance to the flat earth that we needed a Socratic debate on the subject. Accordingly, I opened a debate on an internet forum where I invited flat earthers and globe earthers to present their best cases. At that time, I thought the flat earth was a government-controlled psyop to discredit moon landing debunkers, and I wanted to save my fellow truth seekers from the government psyop. Wow, was I wrong. The flat earth arguments were well-reasoned and substantial. Globe earth arguments were circular, specious, and vacuous. I thought the globe advocates, whose numbers far outweighed the flat earthers, would destroy the flat earthers. But instead of presenting a strong case in favor of the official globe narrative, globe supporters relied on name-calling, fraudulent videos, feeble presuppositions, straw man arguments, conformity, and incessant appeals to authority. From the beginning, I heard the best case the globe had— and it was shockingly pathetic, and it still is. 
We already know that the evil cabal can get away with huge lies. 9-11, Gulf of Tonkin, and the phony moon landings prove that. But I want to talk to you about what I have termed institutionalized conformity. It is the top-down, systematic, institutional conditioning of humanity from cradle to grave, and it created the globe. Institutional conformity is founded on a blend of three elements, the knee-jerk, Pavlovian response, group conformity, and the expert. These three elements have worked in tandem to force society into an unwitting love affair with the globe and space. Many of you are already familiar with the Pavlov's dogs experiment. Essentially, at the end of the 1800s, Ivan Pavlov was able to condition dogs to salivate every time a metronome was played. Pavlov did this by bringing out food while simultaneously playing a metronome. Only after a few repetitions, Pavlov removed the food, but the dogs would still salivate in response to just the sound stimulus. This is referred to as classic conditioning. Of course, we are not dogs. But to an extent, people can also be conditioned. Humanity has been conditioned to love space and the globe. That's a fact. You have seen the globe and other space images thousands of times in your life. In addition to loving space and the globe, you have been programmed to scoff at even the mere mention of the flat earth through unrelenting, repeated conditioning since childhood in schooling, media, and entertainment. Although the narrative is changing from Columbus to ancient Greece, I was taught in elementary school that everyone knew Columbus was going to fall off the edge. But the smart Columbus knew better than the stupid flat earthers, and Columbus proved it was a globe. Even MTV's rebellious channel always started with the U.S. government's Apollo mission to the moon. How rebellious is that? The programming has been unrelenting and everywhere. Public schooling and the grading system were instrumental in creating your inflated globe ego and that conditioned response. But here's a question for you. How do you know when you're having a conditioned Pavlovian response? A Pavlovian response isn't based on reason or intellect. Instead, it triggers a knee-jerk emotional response. It makes you upset or happy in some inexplicable manner. Hopefully, by recognizing that you are having a Pavlovian response, you can set aside the conditioning and instead use your intellect and reason to investigate the flat earth. Here's a hilarious television experiment that took place in a medical office. All of these people are actors except for the lady. Whenever the office buzzer rings, all of the actors stand up. Yes, I added the cartoon ball. It's like Pavlov's dogs, but here the group is establishing the norm. Understandably, the unaware lady quickly follows the group. That's expected, and I doubt any of us would have acted differently, as we often look to the group for information. It's called informational conformity. But what's so fascinating about this is that this lady, after all the actors leave, then teaches others who are also unaware to do the same and creates an entirely new group of conforming, unwitting people. None of the people standing up right now are actors, and yet they are all engaging in the same nonsense based solely on group and informational conformity. Comparably, relatively few people need to be in on the globe lie. Once the narrative has been initiated, which is then reinforced every day in school, in media, and entertainment for generations, nearly everyone will unquestioningly follow the group. They control nearly all of the inputs, and the system then becomes self-policing. It doesn't matter that no one in the group knows why they believe or act in a certain way. The narrative has already been set and is followed religiously by the group in lockstep. Conformists are rewarded and promoted, and nonconformists are ridiculed and demoted. That's why calling flat earthers names is so important to this control mechanism. But the globe needed one more key ingredient, and that's the expert. The Milgram experiment is a fascinating example of the power of institutionalized conformity. In this case, the oblivious person at the electric shock generator called the teacher. Remember, this teacher is the only person who isn't an actor. A learner is placed in a different room. Each time the learner makes a mistake in his responses, the so-called teacher is instructed to give an increasing electric shock to the learner. In a way, it reminds me of the grading system. Via a microphone, the teacher can hear the fake screams when the supposed electric shock is administered to the learner. What you're watching is a modern version that obtained the same results as the original Milgram experiment. 
There were 30 switches on the shock generator marked from 15 volts, slight shock, to 450 volts, danger, severe shock. 450 volts is at a fatal level. On purpose, the learner gave mainly wrong answers. And for each wrong response, the oblivious teacher gave the learner an electric shock, and the teacher could hear the screaming through the microphone. If the teacher refused to administer a shock, the expert in the lab coat next to the teacher would say something like, please continue, or you have no other choice but to continue. After 15 shocks or so, the learner in the other room would go silent so as to create the illusion that the learner was unconscious or worse. But the shocks continued. What's so damn disturbing is the fact that 65% of the teachers continued to the highest level of 450 volts, which was identified as danger severe shock. All of the teachers continued to 300 volts. Despite their morals, ordinary people are likely to follow orders given by an authority figure, the expert. Milgram summed up the experiment as follows. The legal and philosophic aspects of obedience are of enormous import, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple experiment at Yale University to test how much pain an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered by an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the subject's strongest moral imperatives against hurting others. And, with the subject's ears ringing with the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Authority won more often than not. Remember that 65% of the participants thought they severely injured or killed the other person based only on the simple orders of the scientist with white coat. That's the power of the expert. And that's why the cabal has created so many celebrity experts like Einstein, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye the Science Guy, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and others. George Orwell spoke about the expert this way. It will be seen that my reasons for thinking that the earth is round are rather precarious ones. It does not rest on reasoning or on experiment, but on authority. Most people, if asked to prove that the earth is round, would not even bother to produce the rather weak arguments I have outlined above. They would start off by saying that everyone knows the earth to be round, and if pressed further, would become angry. This is a credulous age, and the burden of knowledge which we now have to carry is partly responsible. The power of institutionalized conformity is evident in the following example. In this video, you can hear the child proclaim that the so-called space rocket is actually falling down, as it truly is. Just listen. It's drifting. That's bad. It's doing good so far. Is it? Is that what always happens? Does it always go like that? Yep. It looks bad to me. It's in space, or is it? Is that it? Yep, I think that's it. Rockets don't go to space. They arc and fall into the water, as you can see in numerous examples. The child gets it because he hasn't been programmed extensively enough to unquestioningly accept NASA. Instead, the adult won't allow himself to question his many years of space indoctrination, even though his eyes tell him otherwise. Here's from another video with a different child. The child keeps stating that the space shuttle rocket is going down, but the parent tries to explain it away as though the Earth is churning. Truly, the children were wiser than their parents who refused to see the obvious. The children could easily recognize that the rocket is not going into space, but the parents would not allow themselves to question it. What do your eyes tell you? 
Just look at this space shuttle launch. Does any person here really think that this space shuttle is in space? It's laughable. Do you understand what I mean by institutionalized conformity and how powerful it is and how we need to be wary of it? I need you to set aside your Pavlovian response, your conditioning, your group conformity, your NASA and other proclaimed expert authority figures, and just use your intellect here today as an objective, reasonable person should. Flat Earth is founded on observable, testable, and repeatable experiments that you can do yourself. Flat Earthers don't want group or informational conformity. We don't want you to appoint anyone as your expert. We want you to think for yourself and to test the flat earth yourself and then share your findings with the rest of us. That is the beauty of the flat earth. Flat earth usually begins with the globe curvature formula. At least that's where it started for me. According to the globe math, eight inches per mile squared represents how much a distant object should be hidden below the horizon from a ground level view based on the official mathematical dimensions of the earth i.e. a ball earth with a circumference of 24,901 miles. Under the globe, this is mathematically accurate for all observable distances. So, what's the alleged curvature drop at 6 miles under the globe? I hope everyone can do this now. Square the miles, 6 times 6, multiplied by 8 inches, which equals 288 inches. Divide by 12 to convert from inches to feet. In 6 miles, there should be a curvature drop of 24 feet it gets exponentially worse for the globe. Eight miles distance, 43 feet should be hidden below the horizon. 10 miles, 67 feet. 20 miles, 266 feet. 50 miles, 1,666 feet. 100 miles distance, 6,667 feet should be hidden below the horizon. This massive curvature drop should be seen and experienced every day, but it isn't. And I will show you many examples unquestionably proving this curvature does not exist. But let's first talk about the horizon. If you know my channel, then you probably already know that the horizon test is my favorite proof of the flat earth. It is so easy and so overlooked. Globe supporters and flat earthers have very different views of what the horizon is. Under the globe model, the horizon is a concrete and tangible physical barrier demarcating the point when distant objects are obscured by the curvature. Under the globe, the horizon could theoretically appear closer due to haze, miraging, waves, and swells, but the horizon could never extend further than that mathematical, physical Earth curve edge. On the other hand, Flat Earthers correctly recognize that the horizon is not tangible, but a matter of perspective, and thus the horizon rises with the observer an impossibility under the globe. The fact that railroad tracks meet at the horizon proves the horizon is a matter of perspective. Of course, haze and poor viewing conditions reduce the distance to the apparent horizon, but so long as we have a nice clear day without miraging, we can test the globe horizon and determine its veracity. The globe fails miserably. The distance to the globe physical horizon is roughly 1.225 times the square root of the height of the observer. But you can also use a calculator. This globe curvature calculator calculates both the distance to the horizon and the amount that should be hidden behind the alleged globe curvature. Both of these calculations can prove the flat Earth. You've probably seen the 8 inches per mile squared curvature chart many times, but here's a quick distance to the horizon chart to help you get familiar with the numbers. For example, a person standing on a shore at 6 feet above the water should not see a horizon beyond a mere 3 miles under the globe model. That's definitely measurable if there was such a globe horizon. All the observer needs to prove the flat Earth is a pair of binoculars. But here's a clip where National Geographic was less than honest with its viewers. In this clip, National Geographic stated that because of the curvature of the Earth, that one and a half stripes are hidden behind the curvature. If you're intelligent, you already caught the problem. The horizon is beyond the flag. Therefore, absolutely none of the flag can be hidden behind an alleged curvature. That's impossible. I hope you understand that. National Geographic went to that lake to prove the curvature, but instead proved that National Geographic is a purveyor of disinformation, and there are so many more like them. But let's begin with a positive, easy to proof the flat Earth using the horizon. This was my wife's video. We're looking at some footage filmed by Wide Awake at an observation height of 2.3 feet. 
At an observation height of 2.3 feet, the distance to the horizon under the globe model would be a maximum distance of 1.86 miles. That is very short. We are looking at the Bayport Channel entrance light. It was 3.49 miles away from the observer. According to the curvature calculator, only 1.8 feet should be hidden. Not a big deal, right? But remember that the horizon was supposed to be only 1.86 miles away, and that rack is 3.49 miles away. Does the globe model work here? Of course it doesn't. And here's the reason why I love these horizon distance experiments. The presupposing globe propagandist will tell you that the image of the horizon has jumped the curvature and you're staring at a mirage. Why is that explanation ridiculous? Because the entire rack is still there. Refraction cannot remove the bulge of water in front of the rack and then move the bulge many miles further away without affecting the rack. The entire rack cannot be a mirage since only 1.8 feet should have been hidden. So the globe propagandist wants you to think that the rack stayed in place unaffected while the water bulge selectively disappeared and then reappeared miles further away. They not only want you to believe in bendy water, they want you to believe that this bendy water is magic. I know it's a strong delusion, but please open your eyes. But it gets worse. Here's footage of another rack called Cutter Rock that was 11.24 miles away from my friend. According to the curvature calculator, 59 feet should have been hidden behind the globe. The top light on Cutter Rock is only 16 feet high. You shouldn't see the light whatsoever. Already the globe model fails, but let's look at the horizon distance. You can't see the horizon in this footage, but then Wide Awake was clever and took a time-lapse photo of Cutter Rock with a higher exposure. Here's the photo. What is that? The horizon is beyond Cutter Rock. Remember, the horizon was supposed to only be a maximum distance of 1.86 miles. And this photograph shows a horizon beyond 11.24 miles. Ouch. Now that hurts the globe. Here's another example. For this observation, BMLS B69 was at an elevation of 105 feet above the water. At an observation height of 105 feet, the globe horizon would have to be closer than 12.6 miles. There are three oil platforms. The first one was 11 miles away, the second was 22 miles away, and the third was 26.4 miles away. Based on the official dimensions of the globe, the horizon line should be in front of the second platform. In fact, the second platform should be hidden by 59 feet. The third platform should be almost entirely hidden by 129 feet. As you can see with your own eyes, the horizon, which was supposed to be under 12.6 miles, is not only beyond the second platform, the horizon is beyond the third platform, further than 26.4 miles. We know that none of the third platform is obstructed by the curvature, as the horizon is beyond the platform. Are we to believe that the bulge of water selectively disappeared from in front of the second platform, where it was supposed to be hiding 59 feet, and then the bulge of water reappeared well beyond the third platform, and this disappearing and reappearing magic effect happened all without affecting the two platforms themselves? For this next test, BMLSB69 brought his camera down to just one foot off of the water. At one foot, the distance to the horizon of the globe must be closer than 1.2 miles. There were two platforms visible. The closer one on the right is Platform Hill House at 6.21 miles away. The further one on the left was Platform Habitat. It was 9.41 miles away. Please raise your hand if you see the problem. Where is the horizon line? Remember, the horizon was only supposed to be 1.2 miles away. And the horizon is not only past the first platform at 6.21 miles, it is well beyond the second platform, beyond 9.41 miles. Using this example, I want to teach you how the apparent horizon distance can be used to determine the minimum size of the globe if we did indeed live on a globe. Let's assume that the horizon in this example is at least 10 miles away. Obviously it's further, but 10 miles is fine. But is it possible that no one ever thought to measure the size of the earth by measuring the distance to the horizon? It seems so basic. You believe in a ball? Well, go out and measure it. Where is my Nobel Prize for what should be elementary knowledge? Here's the theoretical radius of the Earth formula using the Pythagorean theorem, and it can be used for any horizon observation. I don't want to bore you with all the calculations, but at an observation height of one foot and a horizon at least 10 miles away, the globe would have to have a radius of 264,000 miles. That's a radius 67 times larger than the alleged size of the globe Earth. I think this disposes of the Big Earth theory. 
I asked Nathan Oakley from the Flat Earth Debate Channel to share his understanding of the horizon issue, and this was his response. Hello, Dallas. The horizon would be most accurately described as an arbitrary position where the sky appears to meet the ground. However, if you are a fundamentalist religious zealot with a globe belief, well then that's not an arbitrary position where the sky appears to meet the ground. It is in fact the reified edge of a sphere world based on the radius value. An R value that is reified into existence by way of a begging the question, proof of nothing, perspective hijacking earth curve calculator that takes an arbitrary position where the sky appears to meet the ground and turns it into the reified edge of a sphere world. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you in Flat Earth Debate. For this first test of mine, my wife was carrying a mirror at the opposite end of a reservoir reflecting the sunlight. From 6.3 miles away, I watched my wife place the mirror into the water. However, under the globe model, my wife should have been entirely obstructed by the curvature with a target hidden height over 12 feet. Obviously, the globe fails. Do you see any visible signs that my wife is a mirage or that a 12-foot section hopped over the curvature to present a false flat earth? There is no distortion accounting for this selective imaginary curvature hopping. These clips are from two separate experiments from opposite ends of Utah Lake. The first test was in May and the second was in freezing conditions in December. In both cases, the spotlight was 7.53 miles away from me and the camera height was only 2.54 feet above the water. In both cases, my wife's spotlight should have been hidden 21 feet below the horizon. Instead, you can see the spotlight placed at the water or ice edge. There is absolutely no curvature in these tests, and the symmetry of the reflection of lights belies the nonsense curvature hopping refraction claim. I don't show this video much, but this was a test I conducted with my family at the Bonneville Salt Flats. I placed my camera at 2.7 feet and filmed my wife drive away on the salt flats. Even with a mirage, I filmed my wife drive 6.6 .6 miles away. The van should have been entirely hidden with a target hidden height of 14 feet. Unfortunately, this test ended in disaster. My wife got stuck in the middle of nowhere, and I was 6.6 .6 miles away from her and also in the middle of nowhere. The tow bill was $800, and it wasn't covered by roadside assistance. Flat Earth testing does not pay very well, and I learned a valuable lesson about the Bonneville salt flats. It can swallow your car. Observable reality has obtained some amazing footage of our flat Earth and is known for getting his camera very low. In this case, his camera was only 0.6 feet off of the water, and he filmed a dam 7.7 .7 miles away. The dam is only 14 feet high. Under the globe Earth's dimensions, 30 feet should be hidden. Obviously, the dam is visible, and the globe fails again to simple and repeatable experimentation that you can do yourself. Notice also that the bridge peninsula on the right was only 3.3 miles away from the camera, but the globe horizon was supposed to be 0.95 miles away. The horizon is well beyond 3.3 miles, again proving the globe faults. The next two experiments were conducted by Flat Earth Reality Explorers in California. The mirror was 13.8 miles away from the camera, which was at a height of 5 feet. Under the globe model, 82 feet should have been hidden below the horizon. Obviously, nothing is missing behind a purported curvature. Sunlight reflection off a mirror at 13.8 miles should not wrap around a ball. But this is my all-time favorite test conducted by Flat Earth Reality Explorers. This mirror flash experiment was conducted at the Salton Sea at opposite sides at a whopping distance of 18 miles. As you can see here, they were able to see and film the reflection of the mirror that was 18 miles away from the camera. 155 feet should have been hidden. Under the globe model, you'd have to be standing on this 150-foot minaret to see a mirror flash at a distance of 18 miles. That experiment absolutely destroys the globe myth and should cause any thinking independent person to conduct their own investigation. This next laser test was conducted in Italy by Romanians. The distance was 9.4 miles, the laser height was 6.6 .6 feet, and the camera height was 2 feet off of the water. 39 feet should be hidden behind the curvature, but the camera filmed the source of the laser at 6.6 .6 feet above the water in defiance of the globe. This next test is from D Marble. In this case, the person holding the laser was at 7 feet, shooting the laser at a distance of 10 miles. At 10 miles, under the globe model, the observer would have to be at a height of 30 feet in order to see the laser source. Instead, you can see the source of the laser at just inches above the water. 
For this test, Dr. John D., who has a PhD, confirmed with a laser that over a distance of 9.5 miles, there's absolutely no curvature. 39 feet should have been hidden under the globe model. Nothing was hidden. One of the common objections I hear is that all of these tests were conducted over water. Well, duh, water is flat and you don't have ground obstructions. But the next two tests by Grota 1 were conducted over ice. In this first test, Grota 1 drove a snowmobile 7.5 miles while he maintained a visual with the distant laser. Here's the laser from 7.5 miles away. This is over frozen, solid ice. Based on an adjusted laser height of 2.4 feet, over 21 feet should have been hidden. Instead, Grota 1 filmed the laser hitting his hand and on the ice at his feet. Here he is filming the source of the laser with his camera only 10 inches off of the ice. In this next test, Grota 1 sets a camera on the frozen lake at a height of 8 inches and then drove 7.4 miles away where he placed a mirror down on the frozen lake at a height of 14 inches. He didn't zoom in so that he could maintain the clock in view and synchronize the mirror. Based on the 8 inch observation height of the camera, 25 feet should have been hidden below the horizon and you can see the tiny mirror flash at only a height of 14 inches. Regardless of the conditions, the globe math fails repeatedly. There are dozens of globe-defined photographs on the Beyond Horizons website. Here's the record photograph of Pic Gaspard at a distance of 275 miles or 443 kilometers. According to the globe model, with an observation height of 9,272 feet, the very top of Pic Gaspard at 12,730 feet should have been hidden 3,772 feet below the horizon. That's the top. Here's another one. This photograph was taken at a distance of 254 miles at an elevation of 9,354 feet on top of Nufance. He photographed Tete del Estrop at sunrise. The peak has an elevation of 9,715 feet. Under the globe math, 12,160 feet should have been hidden. Therefore, the top of the distant peak should have been 2,445 feet below the horizon. But this next photograph may dominate them all. This photograph was allegedly taken at a distance of 326 miles by YouTuber Nouvelle Geographie Planetary. In this case, he photographed a lighthouse at 85 feet above the water. Under the globe math, 43,848 feet should have been hidden. I just asked him the other day if he's certain that he filmed the lighthouse. He said he's very certain, but he'll get more evidence supporting the fact. There are hundreds of more observations and experiments. Just look at the distance of this ship in this clip from Finland by Velo42. If you look closely, there's a huge ship that's further away and barely visible. The entire boat in the front should be hidden, and yet you can see the horizon beyond the boat. A huge impossibility for the globe. Look at this photograph of this lighthouse, also in Finland. 76 feet should be hidden, and none of it is. Without question, we see too far. The globe math doesn't hold up at all. Probably the main objection to the Flat Earth is that NASA and other so-called space agencies have supposedly taken photos of Earth from space. If you have enough sense to realize that this was not a spaceship, that these actors did indeed hang from wires, and that this was not filmed on the moon, but on a Hollywood set in front of 1960s movie backdrops, then you already know that the Apollo pictures of the Earth from space are phony. Regardless, this is supposedly the last photograph from the Apollo missions taken in December 1972, when you look closely, you can tell it's a painting. I do want to thank Math Powerland for exposing NASA's use of hyper-realist space art. In this NASA article, NASA admitted that no photographs were taken of the Earth from space from 1972 until 2015, and that this 2002 blue marble image that you're looking at was created by NASA employee Robert Simmon. Yes, this image is an admitted phony creation from Robert Simmon. We gotta love Robert Simmon who brought us this gem. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. As Simmons stated in this NASA article, then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface clouds and oceans to match people's expectations of how Earth looks from space. That ball became the famous blue marble. So, a NASA employee created a propaganda image of a fake globe to match what you think it looks like using a flat map and computer graphics that looks just as real as any other images from NASA. Be sure to note that a flat map is accurate enough for NASA. But here is the first alleged photograph of the Earth from space in 43 years, taken supposedly in July 2015. When you look closely, you can see what appears to be the word sex spelled in the clouds. At least that's what I thought just a month ago. But now I think it's more sinister. In Revelation 13 verse 18, we're introduced to the mark of the beast, and its number is 666. 
Here are various Greek translations of 666. It looks like the word sex upside down. Now compare the Greek 666 to the alleged July 2015 NASA photographs. The first photograph in 43 years has either the word sex or a Greek 666 in the clouds. Evil saint worshipers or perverts at NASA. You decide, but either way, it's damning to NASA. What about satellites? Why are space satellites even necessary when NASA and its subsidiaries have hundreds and possibly thousands of these so-called space balloons? <laughs> Look at this crash one from Samsung. They called it a space selfie, even though it was attached to a balloon. Here's a list from NASA of hundreds of satellite balloons launched by NASA. Notice that a handful of them were identified as mirror components. There's your Russian mirror space station. Until a few years ago, when Flat Earth exploded, no one spoke of these satellite balloons. This balloon supposedly went into orbit. Most people I talk to even now about this have never seen these satellite balloons. Now we know what Roswell was. For decades, there has been a deliberate whitewash of these balloon satellites evincing that they are lying about space satellites. Space satellites aren't necessary when you can accomplish the same with these much cheaper balloon satellites. These high-altitude balloons can carry 8,000 pounds and include telescopes, radar equipment, communications equipment, internet, etc. There's a GoFundMe project. Start the first space hotel held up by weather balloons. This two-ton balloon satellite, yes, they did call it a satellite, almost killed onlookers. It had cutting-edge NASA telescopes on board. Have you ever heard of a telescope mounted on a high-altitude balloon? I hadn't. Where are the images from these balloon telescopes? Moreover, it is hardly ever mentioned that almost all of our alleged communications come from undersea cables and cell towers, not supposed satellites in space, and the rest of those are held by balloons. Finally, look at these actual NASA videos of space satellites. They are manifestly fake. Look at this one that was launched during a space shuttle mission. It's dangling from a wire. Don't be a moron. That video alone proves they are faking space. The Antarctic Treaty is one of the biggest proofs that they are hiding something huge about our plane from we the people. This is a fact that you can look up yourself. Independent travel is not allowed below the 60th South Parallel. The Antarctic Treaty, its handbook, and its enforcement protocols, which have remained inviolate for 60 years and include signatories like the United States, North Korea, China, and the former Soviet Union, and now Russia, essentially ban any reasonable attempt to explore below the 60th South Parallel under the guise of protecting the environment. They may allow limited excursions to a few tourist points, but independent travel is not allowed, and that's shocking. Think of what has happened in the last 60 years. The Antarctic Treaty survived Vietnam and all of the Cold War, despite the claim that Antarctica is rich in minerals, including coal, oil, and uranium. Were the Soviets really at interest in protecting penguins in the environment? It's ludicrous. Antarctica is the one place that would prove the flat Earth, and it just so happens that independent travel isn't allowed below the 60th South Parallel. And all major nations agreed to this one principle of keeping you out. Are you now starting to see that international relations aren't what we were told? This video by Flat Earth LT shows some unbelievable infrared footage taken over Eastern Europe. At that altitude, the horizon should have been only 220 miles away. It appears as though Flat Earth LT was able to film across the Black Sea over a distance of 887 miles with a curvature hump that would be so substantial as to hide an object 56 miles tall. More importantly, there's absolutely no curvature present, and the horizon is at least 668 miles further than it should be. Watch the video, though, because it looks like they even filmed the other side of the Caspian Sea that would have been roughly 1,500 miles away. Amazing. We already understand that the curvature of the Earth should drop away at 8 inches per mile squared, and the same should roughly apply to airplanes. At 500 miles per hour in 15 minutes, a pilot would have to make a curvature correction in the amount of roughly 10,400 feet. Pilots don't have to dip the nose of the airplane to correct for the curvature regardless of the speed or altitude of the airplane. Globe supporters will claim that it's gravity that is pulling the nose of the airplane down. The airplane is defying the alleged force of gravity, and yet gravity selectively grabs the nose of the airplane, not the whole airplane, but just the nose, to keep the plane level with the ground regardless of the speed or altitude of the airplane. Just like magical refraction, that's some wizard selective gravity you have there.
Critics of Guglielmo Marconi said that it was impossible for Marconi to send a transatlantic transmission due to the curvature of the Earth. Here's an article pointing out that fact. Proving them wrong, Marconi received a radio transmission across the Atlantic Ocean at a distance of 2,135 miles. Under the globe model, there would be a curvature drop of 527 miles over that distance. The Nikobine targeting system was a VHF, that's very high frequency radio targeting system used by German bombers in World War II. Nikobine was an accurate line of sight targeting system and was able to pinpoint ground targets up to 443 miles away in England. The leading government science advisor for Churchill, Frederick Lindemann, refused to believe that there was such a beam due to the curvature of the Earth, as VHF beams don't even allegedly wrap around the curvature. In total, contradiction to the globe, Lindemann was wrong, and lives were lost because of his mistaken belief in the curvature. The Nikobine system did exist, and the VHF line-of-sight targeting system would have been impossible on a globe. In order to make sense of Nikobine, Wikipedia claims that the VHF system remained within line of sight of the bombers. The claim is mathematically wrong. With a distance of 443 miles from Stolberg Hill, Germany, to Derby, England, 117,504 feet should have been hidden, and the German bombers only flew at 19,200 feet. At the equator, the ground is allegedly rotating at 1,037 miles per hour. Yet, Felix Baumgartner took a balloon up to 128,000 feet above the surface, and it took him two and a half hours to get that high. So, if the ground is rotating at 1,037 miles per hour at the equator, then Felix Baumgartner should have landed in the Pacific Ocean. As you are aware, Felix didn't land in the Pacific Ocean. He actually landed 44 miles east of his launch site. That's against the supposed rotation and the wrong direction. Don't you think the rotation of the Earth should have affected Felix's jump in some manner? There is little error up at 128,000 feet, but somehow Felix's balloon magically sped up to keep up with the ground below it. Does that make any sense to you? Even if there is some purported movement of the air at the surface due to the ground's alleged rotation, that air cannot communicate that same motion to the air at higher altitudes, and especially cannot cause that air to speed up. The spinning globe is utter nonsense. There is no evidence that the atmosphere is attached like Velcro to a spinning ball, and the fact that we don't have a 1,000 mile per hour westerly wind proves the faith-based religion of heliocentrism false. In addition to proving the Earth was stationary, Felix Baumgartner proved that the horizon does indeed rise with the observer, an impossibility under the globe which should have affixed decreasing tangible horizon. Here's the horizon line when Felix entered the capsule. Here's the horizon line at 128,000 feet. I did not alter the video. The horizon line didn't drop one iota unequivocally disproving the globe. Professionals who should account for the curvature never actually do. Snipers, surveyors, pilots, civil engineers, military guys, none of them account for the curvature. Mark Sargent has a great series on his channel where he interviews airline pilots, military professionals, radar operators, gunners, missile operators, engineers, commercial surveyors, and many more, all stating that there is no accounting for the curvature or the Earth's rotation in any manner. The solar eclipse is a major proof of the flat Earth for two big reasons. First, the Sun and the Moon are the same apparent size. The Sun is supposed to have a diameter 400 times larger than the Moon. And yet the Sun and the Moon just happen to be the right distances to create the illusion of being the same size? Just think of how impossible that is under the heliocentric model. It is rubbish. Second, the moon is supposed to have a diameter of 2,159 miles, and yet the shadow of the moon is only 70 miles across the Earth's ground during a solar eclipse. That's a very simple proof that the heliocentric model is false. The lunar eclipse is very often raised as the key proof of the globe, but it fails under closer scrutiny. The biggest issue is the well-documented selenelian. A selenelian is where a lunar eclipse occurs when both the sun and the moon are both above the horizon, which means there is no alleged Earth between the sun and the moon that could cause a shadow on the moon. That's geometrically impossible. Again, the globe model fails. According to the heliocentric model, this Earth and its pressurized atmosphere are surrounded by a nearly endless vacuum that's more powerful than any vacuum that can be created here on Earth, and yet this vacuum is so weak that it can't remove our atmosphere. This is a fact, there's simply no possible way that an atmosphere can exist adjacent to a vacuum and no one can prove otherwise. Nature abhors a vacuum, and the last time I checked, we're all still alive, and so you can dismiss the nonsense of space. I have presented a substantial amount of evidence proving that we've been lied to big time, but it takes a strong, 
independent mind to recognize and then set aside one's indoctrination. Unlike the globe propagandists, we flat earthers don't want you to believe or trust us. We don't believe in the flat earth. Please understand that. We tested whether the globe exists and found, based on the extensive amount of evidence that we've gathered, that there is no curvature, that there is no outer space, and heliocentrism is false. But we want you to figure that out for yourself. On the other hand, NASA and its spaniels, liars, parrots, and actors will never tell you to go out and measure the curvature yourself. They are scam artists and deceivers. They want you to be gullible and ignorant as though it's a virtue. Please, reject the illusions, lies, and hypnosis. Break your mental shackles. Come out of the allegorical cave and your stupid, fundamental, heliocentric religion and conduct these experiments and test the globe yourself. Come up with new experiments and ideas. Share what you have. It's fun and it's exciting. Flat Earth is breaking the chains that bind humanity. We absolutely promote intellectual freedom and investigation. And we hope that a new breed of independently-minded professionals, PhDs, and students will, in all humility, work together towards a true and objective grassroots scientific movement. I'm not embarrassed I'm a flat earther. I'm embarrassed it took me 40 years to see the truth that we live on a flat and stationary plane. Flat Earth comes with a big serving of humility. Based on experimentation, testing, and genuine reflection, we all came to realize that the Earth is flat and stationary that outer space is fake, and that NASA lied, and that is huge, and that's enough for me to call you family. I very much love you all like my family. May our love, friendship, and addiction for truth never cease on this beautiful, flat, and stationary plane. God bless you all.